Buenos dias. Uh, good morning, everyone. It's an honor to be here. I am a postdoc at MIT in the group of Regina Barzilai, and today I'm talking about how we use NLP to turn data into information and possibly into knowledge. So every company faces challenges that are uh, uh, typical for that kind of business. But there are challenges that are common to all companies. And one of them is taking informed decisions. And to take informed decisions, you need to monitor a lot of uh, sources and channels of information, like news, social media, scientific papers, regulators, and so on. So you may think this is easy today because of internet, because of the high cognitivity that we have. But actually, this is not true. The amount of data that is being published every day on the web is, is increasing in an incredible way. Um, between 2005 and 2016, uh, the amount of data passed from 0.1 zettabyte to 13 zettabytes, where every zettabyte is 1,000 billion of gigabytes, to give you an idea of the amount. In one minute, uh, we send about 204 million emails. We mm, query on Google 4 million times, and we post on Facebook uh, 2.5 million times, and so on. So this to give you an idea of the amount of data that we are creating every minute. So as the amount of data grows exponentially, the ability of taking advantage of this data, of monitoring this data, grows linearly. So you can see there that we create a gap between the, information, the data that we have and the information that we can actually use. The major reason for this problem is that uh, about uh, uh, only about 20% of the data is structured. And by structure, I mean in the form of table, Excel files, databases, and so on. The 80% is in form of uh, uh, free text and other kind of uh, uh, structures that computers don't understand. So having uh, unstructured data is like having a book on the shelf and not reading it. You know that there is some knowledge in that book, but you don't read it. So you will never know what kind of knowledge there is inside. So the question is, can we can we create value out of it? Well, uh, we can, but we are using the wrong technology. We are actually using an outdated technology, which are human beings. Human beings uh, can read up to 1,000 words per minute with a comprehension rate of 85%. This is the reason why, from the 80s, uh, uh, we uh, help human beings with uh, uh, machines like, uh, like uh, personal computers. Personal computers has, have actually invaded uh, our offices, and now, nowadays, you, we cannot even imagine an office without the personal computers. What they allow us to do? To search information uh, in a non-sequential way, by searching keywords, regular expressions, and so on. But they actually don't have any understanding of what the text means. This is a huge cost. According to the International Data Corporation, uh, basically about 60% of the executives uh, in the industry are complaining about the lack of a technology that allows to search for information and actually find it. This is uh, uh, important. About 30% uh, uh, of the time that knowledge workers spend at uh, work is invested in searching for information, which often is not even found. So you can imagine it's like hiring three people and one of them doesn't get to the office because he's searching the way to get to the office. In uh, terms of uh, money, uh, we are talking about uh, 2.5 million of dollars per year every 1,000 employees in this kind of field. So how can the natural language processing uh, help? Well, there are methods that uh, help to extract information, like uh, uh, entities, events, and relations. And then there are methods that allow to aggregate this information and organize it into knowledge so that uh, uh, executives can take actions. And actions uh, mean taking decisions or generating uh, information. So but how does it all work? It works uh, with two basic principles that uh, uh, if you understand them, then it's gonna be everything, everything is going to be much easier. One is the representation, which is like those vectors that you see there. Everything that you want to elaborate in natural language processing has to be represented with vectors. And these vectors contain numbers that uh, uh, represent some meaning, eventually, of the words, sentences, text, documents, whatever you want to represent. And the other concept is similarity. 
So once you have uh, represented uh, text into vectors, you can uh, uh, project these vectors into a vector space, like the one that you see in the uh, picture in the, in the bottom. And you can calculate the similarity between these vectors. And when you calculate the similarity between these vectors, you actually know the semantic similarity between uh, what these vectors are representing. For example, if you look at this vector space, you can see that there are uh, some words that are closer to each other than others. For example, school and college are very close to each other. The reason is that school and college are much more similar than uh, uh, teach and curriculum, for example. And if you look at these distances a bit more carefully, you can uh, reach something that is very interesting that Professor Roth uh, uh, shortly introduced, which is uh, uh, reasoning. Um, so, uh, it has been demonstrated a few years ago that uh, uh, if you uh, play a little bit mathematically with these vectors, you can actually do some analogical reasoning, which also comes from Aristotle, if I'm not wrong. Uh, so you can take uh, the vector of king, you can subtract uh, from the vector of king uh, the vector of uh, man, and you can add the vector of woman, and you end up having the vector of queen. So basically you can pass from a vector and you can arrive to another by doing some reasoning. And this can be done also for geographical uh, relations. For example, you can uh, subtract Rome from Italy, add Madrid, and you're going to get Spain, which is interesting. And this kind of uh, uh, mathematical approaches can be applied also on uh, sentences and documents and uh, other pieces of text that you may be able to represent. But uh, the problem here is exactly the representation. Um, once you have uh, these representations, if the representations are powerful enough, then you can apply supervised learning, which uh, allows to uh, basically learn and uh, optimize a task by reducing an error over annotated data. So you have like an input, the expected output, and the system slowly learns to uh, adapt its parameters so that it can learn something. In this case, it's learning how to split uh, the blue points from the red points. And uh, you can imagine that the blue points are people without cancer, the red points are people with cancer. So the system is learning how to discriminate one from the others. The most common uh, uh, supervised approach nowadays is the neural networks, and in particular deep learning. Uh, it's, a, it's an approach that you probably know already. It's based on uh, uh, the neural connection. The, it's inspired by the neural connection in the human cortex. And uh, uh, it has been demonstrated in the last years that it's very powerful and it allows to reach, actually, very good results in uh, very specific tasks. Okay, so now that I have given a, a little bit of overview, let me enter in uh, three uh, case studies that we have done at MIT. Um, and they are about uh, transforming this data into information. The first of them is in healthcare. So, uh, as of today, in the cancer research, uh, all the decisions that are taken are generally taken on 3% of the people, that, of the population that have actually participated in the clinical trial. The reason for uh, leaving out the 97% is that uh, to uh, take decision over, uh, over this data, you have to actually encode this data uh, manually. So there's people that manually write these reports, and then from the reports, they manually introduced this data into databases. And databases is the only place where you can do actually reasoning and do, do all these, uh, these kind of operations. So the challenge here is to get a, a, a clinical report, like in this case it's a breast cancer, breast, uh, sorry, pathology report, and turn it into a database, like the one that you see here, where you have the attributes, and then for every attribute you have uh, the value. We took this challenge a couple of years ago in uh, our lab, and uh, we created a, a convolutional neural network that gets an input to the report for every word in this report, to turn, uh, transform every word in this report into a vector, so into a representation. And then the supervised uh, approach learns how to turn this report into, uh, into actual data. Here it's predicting, for example, whether uh, a typical ductal hyperplasia is present in this report, and in this case it is. And uh, this system uh, uh, achieved uh, approximately 96% uh, of accuracy, which is uh, uh, very close, if not higher, than what humans can do. Uh, in fact, uh, doing this uh, process manually is also uh, error-prone. 
So uh, the other thing that is very interesting is that we can run uh, this system in a few hours over 160,000 report. If we ask a human being to do that, it would take years, if not decades. And uh, these reports are about 90,000 uh, patients, and they include uh, information about breast, prostate, lung, pancreas, and other organs. A recent study that is about to be published, to which I contributed, uh, shows that uh, this system, if it's uh, trained on data from multiple hospitals, uh, and uh, these hospitals uh, do not use the same format of report, they use different formats of report, uh, the system is able basically to generalize. So that if you take uh, reports from a new hospital that was not present in the training set, the system still works. It still works with a very high accuracy, over 93%. So, why is this important? Because uh, as of today, most of the research has been done uh, on uh, 300 uh, or 600 uh, cases. But with a system like that, we can base this research on 6,000 or even more, depending on how much data we have. So, if you can uh, do researches on a much, much larger population, you can have better results, more accurate, more fine-grained, and so on. The second case that I'd like to talk about is uh, in the pharmaceutical domain. Um, sometimes the input that we get is not in the form of a, a sequential text. Sorry for the blurred uh, slides, but uh, there are privacy issues here. Uh, so, um, so sometimes uh, it's not in, the, in, a, in a sequential text, but it's organized with layouts. Here you can see six examples of layouts. Uh, and, uh, when you have layouts, the layouts also include some information. So the way the order, uh, the information is presented is important. So we didn't want to miss that. So what, what are these, uh, these forms? These forms are adverse event case reports, uh, which are the forms that the doctors feel whenever somebody complains about a side effect of a drug. These are very important uh, forms because uh, they allow companies and the FDA, the Food and Administration, uh, uh, sorry, Food and Drug Administration, to monitor uh, the drugs on the market and see whether some of these drugs can harm people and uh, they can eventually take uh, actions. So, how many of these reports are published every year? Look at that. We are talking about uh, more than a million of these reports every year. So, having a system that monitors it uh, and uh, monitors that many reports is very, very important to act immediately when a drug can harm. We got a data set of about 80k of these reports. They were annotated manually in five years. So we said they create over a million and 80k were annotated manually in five years. We got them and we had three or four months to create a system that could extract the information from them. These reports uh, consist of about nine pages on left mm, and then uh, they show more than 15 templates. We were asked to extract information about the patient, about the reporter, about the location, about the kind of side effect, and about the drug that was involved. And here we go. We decided to use a graph system, so we turned these reports into a graph. Every single piece of text that you see there uh, was uh, considered as a node, and then we connected the node with horizontal and vertical edges. And once we had uh, this uh, graph representation, we, we passed it to a neural network, a neural network with uh, graph convolutional uh, networks. And uh, what happens is that we encode every single piece of text, and then we propagate information between the various pieces of text. And as a result, we have the uh, extracted information, for example, the date, the city, and so on. And this is the accuracy we obtain. Okay, this is not 96% like it was before, it's 81% because the task is much more complex, but we did it in three months. Same things that was done by humans in, uh, uh, with a little bit higher accuracy in five years. And uh, mm, let me move to social media. All businesses need to monitor social media because in social media, uh, there are information about the market, there are information about uh, our uh, products, and so on. So at a certain point, we decided to uh, check a little bit and profile the people 
uh, in the social media, and we wanted to profile them by discovering their education, where they were educated, and their jobs. We got a network, and for every user we want to discover their education and their jobs, we, con we uh, extracted all the tweets that that person has published, and all the tweets of the followers of that person. So we create ego networks. And then we start going word by word with the system, uh, uh, and I try to identify where these people were educated and which kind of job they, they had. For education, we got an accuracy of 66.5 uh, accuracy. Uh, so that the reason here is, is a little bit low, but still informative. The reason is exactly the ambiguity that Professor Roth has introduced before. Uh, sometimes Chicago appears as a city, sometimes as the University of Chicago, and, and the system made mistakes in this case. But in the companies, we got an accuracy of 92.5% or 0.9%. So we could predict where a person worked with very, very high accuracy. And that was like relatively easy to do. So let me summarize a little bit what uh, I have discussed so far. Unstructured data, which is dominant, is dead knowledge. If we don't turn it into information, we cannot take knowledge out of it, so we cannot take actions for it. So far we are using uh, uh, human beings in, to do this operation with all the limitations that human beings have. And, uh, for example, the speed, there it is low, and sometimes not perfect. Now, NLP offers some methodologies that are much faster, probably not as accurate as humans, so probably a suggestion would be to combine uh, machine learning and humans, and uh, think a little bit about the benefit of this. Think uh, about uh, um, the possibility of uh, using humans for smarter tasks, like research. If you extract all this information, and then you put your uh, employees to actual, anal actually analyze this information, you can obtain better results. And uh, in a sector like healthcare or like uh, pharma, you can actually save lives. So cost reduction is a consequence, uh, increase of productivity, and possibly this will make also the products that these companies create cheaper, so they will be affordable for people. Uh, I don't have conclusions in my slides, because I think this is a story that uh, still needs to be made. There are still problems, as uh, uh, it was announced before, uh, but we are navigating towards the solutions. This uh, uh, graph represents the uh, revenue uh, in, uh, in the last, uh, approximately, in, in these 10 years. Um, and uh, you can see that uh, in 2015 it was about 277 millions of uh, US dollars, and in 2024 it will be 2,000 millions of US dollars. So there's a lot to do there, and uh, we are working for it. Thank you, and uh, I'd like to thank uh, all the people I work with, in particular uh, my PI, Regina Barzilai, uh, Adam Yala, and uh, Kevin Hughes on the healthcare side, uh, Yuji uh, Chan, uh, Zhang Wo, and uh, Ji Jingji in uh, the extraction from pharma and social media. Thanks. <laughs>